Okay. Happy Monday, everyone. So correct me if I'm wrong. You you have classes this week and next week, and then you're you're off not until like the 22nd, right? Okay. Um, so I don't have I'm not supposed to work next week because the college is off. So next week will likely be a catch-up week for y'all. I'll probably have some sort of assignment, but there won't be new material. And it'll be something you should be easily able to finish before break starts. All right, so because every, because we've been working so hard and everybody's been doing such a good job keeping up with the material, we're still on pace. We won't even, we'll still be able to take time when we come back to do a little review to get you back into the swing of things. Normally this point in the quarter, um, we're kind of like going pedal to the metal, trying to get as much done as possible. We're actually in a really good shape here. So I feel pretty good letting you have, you guys have kind of a down week in this class next week um, with just a little bit to make sure you're staying current and getting some more practice. Does that sound reasonable? Cool. Awesome. Glad to hear it. All right, go ahead. Good. So the question was the, about the final schedule. The the final for this class, we we have it set up so it's going to align to the the final schedule for the rest of the um, rest of the classes here. Typically, what I do in this class is the the in class timed portion of the final is going to be a lot like the midterm, where it's going to be mostly basic skills, um, not a whole lot of like on the fly problem solving. Um, usually what I do, though, since we have spent a lot of time practicing a, a lot of problem solving, usually there'll be um, probably two questions that will be take home questions. And we'll talk about the rules for that when we get closer to it. But it'll be you'll have about 20 points that will be take home. that will be open book, open note, um, work in groups if you need to, um, that sort of thing. You'll have about a week to do that. And then the in class part of the test will be on the final schedule so you'll have the full two hours um so if you felt the midterm was a little bit too tight timing wise um don't panic because you will have a little bit more time for the final although i would still if you felt like there was time pressure on the midterm um, i would encourage you to practice when you're doing your studying and practicing kind of map out about how long you think each section should take you so you have an idea of where you should be spending your time um, to get the most amount of points, right? Um, you sh you should be able to get, you know, the easy stoichiometry problem should have been, you know, nine or 10 points out of 10 points and should have only taken you 90 seconds. And then some of the ones, some of the other sections were still 10 points, but might have taken you a lot longer, like the conversions, for instance. So more, I'll give more test taking strategy when we get closer, but um, the, that's kind of the general idea. And it will be, was it that last week of January, right? The final will be, it will be emphasizing the stuff we've done since the midterm, but I still expect you to know all the rest of it. So usually what I do is I'll kind of combine a few of the sections that were each their own problem before, like counting protons, neutrons, and electrons, and um, electron configurations would be in the same I guess we did that before on the midterm, but basically I wind up combining a few of the, the concepts to sort of make room or expand on the stuff that you were tested on on the, mid, on the midterm. Um, but uh, it's going to be a lot of the same stuff um, in, in a way that hopefully is, um, hopefully that is uh, reassuring to you. It'll, it should be, and again, you'll have a practice test, so you'll have an idea. Um, the week before and be able to know go into the test with no no surprises there but we'll have more more details on all that as we get as we get closer in uh when we come back in january from our holiday break um a couple of quiz questions uh somebody asked about I, I always refer to like isotopic and molecular masses and things like that it might be different if we were on a different planet right um, so somebody asked, are, do gas laws differ on different planets? Um, the answer is no, not really. The gas laws are more or less constant. And it turns out they're not actually 
you can actually go all the way back to some basic statistics, not basic, it's fairly complicated statistics. Um, but if you, if you just go, we'll talk about some of the, these concepts today, but if you just treat gas molecules like they're just ping pong balls with a certain mass and velocity, um, you can actually derive all of our gas laws all the way from what they call ab initio, which means fr from first principles. You can basically just start from raw statistics and K e or Ke equals one half mass times velocity squared and get all the way to our gas laws. So they're pretty applicable to anything, um, anything that behaves like um, random spheres bouncing around into things with a certain amount of kinetic energy, um, which is kind of cool. Um, Somebody else asked about the most pressure a human has been able to sustain. I threw this one in there specifically also. Jacob's not here, I don't think. Um, he was right about the uh, how deep you have to go. It's every 10 meters down in water. That's about one atmosphere of pressure from the water. Um, so I thought it was every 10 feet or 12 feet. It's every 10 meters, so more like 33 feet. Uh, and with that in mind, the, the depth, record for a human with a scuba diving suit um, is about 330 meters, which would make it about 34 atmospheres of pressure. Um, so turns out if you give the human body enough time to adjust, like we talked about, um, it can handle a huge amount of pressure relative to what we can, we can see on um, uh, at the surface at sea level. Uh, the, other the flip side to that, though, is we're not very good going the other direction. There are actually hard limits when it comes to um, what's the lowest pressure we can sustain. We can sustain outside of a spacesuit, even with a like a scuba mask sort of situation. There are still limits where your your body can't handle losing pressure um, nearly as well as it handles um, increasing pressure, which is kind of interesting. Also, do you, does anybody want to take a guess at what the, the uh, maximum depth you, that has been recorded by humans free diving without scuba, without fins, without anything? It's, it's about 103 meters. Um, so a little over 300 feet in one breath with no scuba tank and no fins even. You let them use fins. You can go down, I believe I read it was something like 170 meters. Um, so people, turns out people are nuts sometimes. And when they get obsessive about certain hobbies, like there's a, you know, it's impressive what the human body can do. Um, I haven't watched it, but there's also a documentary on free diving competitions and on Netflix right now that I've heard is really good. Um, it might be called like Deep Blue or something like that, but uh, if you're interested in that, if that's something that is intriguing to you, um, again, I haven't seen it, but I've heard good things. Check it out. And then you come back and tell me whether it was watch, watch, worth watching or not. Um, how do real gases behave differently than what gas laws predict? And how is that taken into account in real world situations? Well, we ended talking about the ideal gas assumptions and van der Waals gases. Um, but that's basically that's when we wind up with the ideal gas law sort of breaking down is when those two gas law assumptions, ideal gas assumptions break down. And that, those two assumptions were, who remembers them? It was polarity and size of molecules, right? So interactions, we're assuming no intermolecular interactions. And that the size of the gas molecules don't matter either. And the way we, we phrase that is that um, the gas molecules have, have zero volume. And these are decent assumptions within sig figs for most of the time. Um, also, just because I'm a bit, um, I'm a bit picky when it comes to misspelling, misusing homophones, words that sound the same as other words, like there, 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 or two, two, and two. 
Um, gases with two S's in the middle is a verb when you are gassing something. Um, gases like a chemical system is just one S. Not that I would ever mark you down on that, but just for your own edification. My sixth grade teacher was really a stickler. That's like the only thing about English that he taught us was um, how to know whether you're, you should be writing yours versus you are, um, things like that. So that has stuck with me for however many years since then. Um, last but not, not least here is somebody wanted some clarification about ice tables and equilibrium versus stoichiometry. Well, there, there are a couple of things here. One, the ice, ice tables work no matter what. We're actually gonna do an example today where we use, where it's really, really helpful to use an ice table in, um, in a reaction that does go all the way to completion. Um, but they, they always work because all an ice table is, is keeping track of how much is being used and how much is being produced the nice thing about an ice table is it keeps track of that all at once for every molecule all at once, because as the reaction is happening, you can always say, okay, every time it happens, I lose one molecule of this, two molecules of this, and I make one molecule here, two molecules there. All right, so you can always use the ice tables um, with either equilibrium or stoichiometry problems. And when I would usually, I find them the most useful when you care about more than one concentration at a time, or more than one number of moles. Um, if you only care about your theoretical yield, then you don't really need to worry about using an ice table, if you're, especially if it's theoretical yield of one compound in particular. But if you ever have a situation like we're going to do today where you, um, with gas laws, where your total pressure in a system depends on how many moles of all of the gases you have. In which case, if everything is a gas on products and reactants, you need to know your total number of moles at the end. In that case, it's really helpful to be able to keep track of all of those at the same time. Um, and so when it comes to whether or not we're supposed to treat a reaction like it's just a stoichiometry problem or if it's an equilibrium problem, well, one, if you're given an equilibrium constant, that's a pretty good hint. But if you're even if you're not, if the reaction is written the way the arrow is written, tells you. If you just have A plus 2B with a single arrow goes to C plus 2D, that arrow tells you you're supposed to treat it like stoichiometry problem. Find your limiting reactant, find your theoretical yield the way we've been practicing it. As soon as you make it an arrow forward and an arrow backwards, that's specifically telling you, treat this like an equilibrium problem. Does that make sense? This is the arrow itself is going to be pretty much foolproof across the board. It's pretty universally used. When it's written like this, it's equilibrium. So in real life, you want us to like do an experiment where you want like more accurate data. Should we always treat it like an equilibrium? Yeah, you, it's it's always gonna be more accurate to treat it like it's an equilibrium problem. But if K is big enough or small enough, sometimes it's within sig figs, you can just say, um, you know, we're assuming the reaction goes to 100% and you won't be able to tell the difference uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, especially with really big equilibrium constants. Is there anything else I wanted to say there? All right. Who's heard of the Hindenburg? I think we've talked about it, right? Some some of the stories of my misspent youth. Um, I may have made an analogy to the Hindenburg. So Hindenburg is a hydrogen-filled airship that exploded when hydrogen gas inside reacted with oxygen to form water as a gas. Let's write out and balance that reaction. And then we're going to practice doing some, uh, some math with it. The idea is to figure out how many moles of hydrogen were in Hindenburg. Start by balancing the reaction out, though.
quick note, there were four or five of you who um, on the write out the write out the equation of the or write out the reaction problem on the quiz got docked a quarter of a point because you managed to put all of the subscripts for the phases except for the very last one. Um, so if you missed a quarter of a point on that one, that's probably what happened is you, you got to the end and like, cool, I'm done and didn't hit, you know, parentheses liquid at the end um, or something like that. Just in case you were checking your quiz scores and were wondering. Are we balanced? What do we need? Yeah, we can't just make a single water molecule because we have start with two oxygens over here. And then if that means we have four hydrogens, so we need four hydrogens here. So if the Hindenburg had an estimated 5.0 times 10 to the sixth cubic feet, how many moles of gas is that? A lot. Well, we've got cubic feet. What do we need our volume to be in if we want to use PV equals NRT or any of our gas laws, really? Liters. Liters works much more conveniently than dealing with cubic feet. So let's take our cubic feet and put it in liters. Who remembers how to do that conversion? You go cubic feet to cubic centimeters. You could go all the way to cubic meters, but if we are using all exact conversions, it's good. we're gonna to get to cubic centimeters first. And why is that an advantage? Because cubic centimeters is milliliters. So then we can go to liters from there. So 5.0. E, was it six, 10 to the sixth? Yeah. We want to go cubic feet to cubic inches. You probably don't have that conversion memorized, but you probably have 12 inches to feet memorized. So we can do that three times. Everybody remember how to do that? If you have a conversion that involves one power, if we want to do it three times, you have to convert all three of these to inches. So when we cube this, we'll get 12 cubed, inches cubed, one cubed, and feet cubed. One cubed is easy enough, right? And then we want to go inches to cubic centimeters. One inch, 2.54 centimeters, three times. And then we can say for every thousand cubic centimeters is one liter. Do I need to cube this one? Why not? Already. Cubic centimeters is already cubed. If we tried to cube this conversion factor, we'd wind up with centimeters to the ninth and liters cubed. And I don't even know what a liters cubed would look like. So let's just not do that. You can try and visualize what liters, even liters squared, liters squared even is pretty hard to try and imagine what that might be like. All right, and well, if you want another thing to boggle your mind, um, has anybody heard the word tesseract before? Does anybody know what a tesseract is in the mathematical sense, not in the marble sense? Yeah, it's if you can picture going from a square, a square is two dimensional, right? A cube is the three dimensional version of a square. A tesseract is a four dimensional equivalent of a cube. So it's a four dimensional object, which we can't even really visualize, but if you mathematically take a slice of it in any direction, you get a cube which again, I can't even, I don't even know what to do with that. But mathematicians say that it's a thing. So take it with grain of salt. 
Did they mention it in Interstellar? That was like the sea. Yeah, they. That was supposed to be a position. That makes sense. That. And if you're looking for a good science movie, Interstellar's science is really well done, all the way up to the point where they go into the black hole. At which point, everything is just pure speculation. It was, wasn't it? All right, what do we get for a number here for leaders? Five million times a thousand-ish times 10. So we get something, something times 10 to the 10. Ish, don't. Don't hesitate to speak up if I did that wrong in my head. I oh, I forgot to divide by a thousand at the end. That uh, still would expect it to be more than, so that's gonna be roughly cancel each other out. So we get something, this is gonna be about 10. So I'd be expecting something times 10 to the seven now. Did I remember that last? Okay. That matches close enough with our reasonableness check. Because I did round that down to 10, and I just rounded that to 10, so I wasn't that close in my estimate anyway. So now how do we figure out how many moles of hydrogen were in the airship? Assuming STP. Yeah, we can use that that shortcut. You can either use definition of STP to, to uh, get, you know, that you're at one atmosphere of pressure and zero Celsius. You can use that and then plug into PV equals NRT. Or you can say that if we're at STP, every 22.414 liters is one mole. Save ourselves some troubles, save ourselves some algebra. Not that it's really that tricky to solve for N if you have all the pieces of PV equals NRT, but this is just even faster usually. What do we get? At least something times 10 to the six. Six. six three. Uh, if you want to practice using PV equals NRT, just from the problem, here's our starting volume that we just figured out. Standard temperature and pressure gives you pressure equals 1.00 and just assume infinite sig figs. Temp temperature is zero Celsius, which is 273.15 Kelvin. And R is a constant, right? So if you wanted to, you should get the exact same answer. Sure. Within, within to three sig figs, maybe plus or minus one in the last digit, if you plugged it into PV equals NRT and solve for N. Exactly. So a reminder that 22.414 only works if you're at standard temperature and pressure. If your temperature is zero Celsius and your pressure is one atmosphere, then you can use that 22.414 number. If you're not at STP, you can't make that 22 liters per mole assumption, right? Being able to use that shortcut is one of the reasons why we have a standard temperature and pressure, just because it's a nice shortcut and they're pretty common conditions.
Um, but if we were assuming room temperature and at 0.8 atmospheres at altitude, or if we we're below zero Celsius because it was a cold weekend, then we would be we would need to plug those in. We couldn't get around around using PV equals NRT. So in this case, we'd get uh, one ATM times one point four two easily eight liters over R is zero point zero eight two oh six liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin and temperature two seventy three point one five Kelvin. Remember, R is on your equation sheet, so you don't have to have it memorized. Make sure all your units match up and you don't need to do any more conversions. But again, we should get the same number to three sig figs. Or I guess I should say the same number within sig figs. What do you get, man? 6.34. So off by two in the last digit, which probably means based on route rounding, that the actual answer, if we kept infinite sig figs, is, would be 6.33-ish, plus or minus 0 0.01 in each direction. I would still consider that to be within sig figs. In fact, on the, on the quiz, um, based on where you rounded on the temperature conversion one in particular, um, there were a, there was kind of a range of answers. Somebody got his, so what was the answer? It was, it was something point two, I think, is what is what the um, the answer that I had in Canvas was. I don't remember what the exact two twelve point two. Anyway. Um, 312.2. Somebody, you following all the regular rules of rounding, you could manage to get off by as much as 0.5 Kelvin and still have the right number of, of um, sig figs. Sometimes you get unlucky with the rounding. Sometimes you wind up rounding in such a way that, that the differences wind up getting exacerbated. That still would be considered the same number as far as I'm concerned when it comes to sig figs, 312.2 versus 312.7. You round it, you went to the right digit, even if it does wind up by off being off by more than our regular rules for uncertainty would predict, that's still a full credit answer. Just like I would consider these to be the same number. They're close enough and they're to the right power that I'm, I'm pretty convinced you didn't do anything wrong in terms of your calculations. It's just a difference in rounding. And as much as I give the mathematicians flack, this is why mathematicians take issue with scientists is because we'd say that's the same number and then they get all bent out of shape and no, it's not, it's off by 0.5. How, what do you mean it's the same number? Um, because mathematicians don't deal with sig figs and uncertainty. Nothing against mathematicians. Some of my best friends are mathematicians. But I'll I'll let them know where they're off base. All right, so let's take this same same reaction forward, assuming that we're not going to run out of oxygen when the Hindenburg explodes. If this reaction releases 285.8 kilojoules per mole of hydrogen, how much energy is released when it explodes? A little bit. Yeah, there, frankly, most of the city is pretty lucky that it exploded pretty slowly because it didn't all get perfectly mixed. If it had already been perfectly mixed the, with that two to one hydrogen to oxygen rate ratio, um, and it all exploded and released all this energy at once, we get a really big explosion. As it was, it was much more of a slowly expanding fireball 
still very dangerous, but not nearly as bad as it could have been. If we have an energy in terms of kilojoules per mole, and we have moles, what should we do with kilojoules per mole? Think back to when we first dealt with energy, right? Use it like a conversion, just like we would with density to go from a volume to a mass. You can use kilojoules per mole to go from moles to kilojoules. For every one mole of hydrogen, it's 285.8 kilojoules released. So we'll get something in the 100 millions range. No, just over a billion kilojoules. And just because I don't quite remember off the top of my head what the numbers were. Uh, So this is going to be what in terms of it's a billion kilojoules. That's going to be 10 to the 12 joules, right? 10 to the 12 joules. And, the, and our prefixes go kilo is 1,000, mega is a million, giga is a billion, is 10 to the 9. What's after giga? Who remembers? Or has your conversion sheet in front of you? Terra. So 1.8 terajoules of energy released, which is about a fifth of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. Hmm. So all things considered, the fact that it didn't level half the city was a pretty good ending for the Hindenburg as far as, if, as long as you weren't, you know, on the airship at the time. So you can't, this reaction can't happen if there's no oxygen, right? But so, but if you start this reaction at the surface where there's a little bit of oxygen and then the hydrogen and the oxygen keep expanding and mixing, the reaction continues going. It's the difference between lighting a candle and burning and releasing all the energy in the candle all at once. So if we had taken a third of the original volume and replaced it with oxygen to begin with, so that the oxygen and hydrogen were already pre-mixed. Yeah. Um, I guess another good example, it's like the difference between lighting the top of a can of gasoline and, um, and I don't know, spraying it or inside of a cylinder and having it ignite all at once, more or less, because it's all pre-mixed. That's what a car, or not a, um, that's what fuel injection does, and I believe what a carburetor's job is, although my small engine's theory is rusty. And a carburetor's job is to mix the fuel with oxygen in the right ratio so that you get complete combustion all at once in the cylinders. Yeah, the carburetor handles the injecting part of it, but then... There you go. So... We wouldn't have been able to release quite as much if we had done that, but that would have been a much bigger disaster because it would have created a huge fire, not just a slowly expanding fire, but a, a shock wave at that point. All right. So we talked We've talked again already about today's, so today's lecture is basically expanding on gas laws a little bit. We'll still do some practice with PV equals NRT, but we'll talk a little bit more about going uh, more in depth using the Van der Waals equation. We'll do a practice problem like that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of those statistics that I mentioned um, and, and how we can apply some of those ideas to real world situations. All right, so the Van der Waals equation 
was this more complicated version of PV equals NRT. It's the, the corrected pressure times the corrected volume equals NRT. So those corrections, volume minus N times B, that's correcting for the first assumption, right? The first assumption, moles have no volume. Well, this is basically saying, okay, well, for every mole of uh, gas molecules you have, B is just how much a single mole takes up. So this is basically the actual volume of the empty container minus the volume of the gas molecules themselves. And the second piece is the corrected pressure. A is basically how well the molecules interact with each other. And as mentioned before, this N over V squared is proportional to the likelihood that two molecules run into each other. Right, the number of molecules you have in the space they have to move around in determines what that likelihood is that they actually run into each other. Right, because basically for the, for gas molecules to run into each other, they have to be in, try to be in the same spot at the same time, right? So the more gas molecules you have divided by the volume that gas molecule has to work in squared. And that squared is because if I say that there's, I don't know, there's five boxes that a gas molecule could be in, and it has to pick one at random. Well, if there's no other gas molecules in there, then there's five choices, right? One gas molecule times five choices. The odds that it picks this spot are one in five, right? In order for the second molecule to run into it, the second molecule also has to choose that same spot at the same time. So now if we want these two to run into each other, it's not a, there's not five choices. If they're going to run into each other, it has to pick the same spot. So the probability that both gas molecules pick the same spot at the same time is going to be equal to, well, we could get into the probability theory, but that's beside, beside the case. Um, basically, you need to take into account both molecules' positions, and that's why it has that squared term there. Um, and that idea, the idea of applying probability to really small systems, what we call a toy model, and then applying it to much larger systems where we, instead of having two particles, we actually have two moles of particles, um, is what's called statistical mechanics winds up being really important. All right, so if we're going to use this equation, one, like I mentioned before, solving for N or V gets really tricky if, we, if we're using this equation. The other piece to it um, is you have to know A and B. And so usually the way that that looks is we just have a, um, a table. Um, okay, for helium, here's A and here's B. For xenon, here's A and here's B. Right, so basically, depending on what the gas is, you just have to go look up A and B. So one of the things we can look at is, so B, remember, is our correction for the volume, right? And units on B kind of makes sense. It's liters per mole. It's our units for B which kind of makes sense. How many liters does one mole take up if you remove all the empty space? Um, and the larger the gas molecule is, the bigger B is. So xenon is 0.05, but helium is 0.02. Makes sense, right? A is representative of how much they interact when they do bump into each other. So what would we expect to have large values for A? Water. Why? Because it it's polar. It has lots of interactions, right? It turns out also beyond just polarity, most all of these are nonpolar with the exception of water. Um, but they, there are some others that have even larger interaction coefficients. And that's because um, they tend to have 
more electrons in general. More electrons in general means the molecule will behave more like a, um, you know, a bean bag rather than a pool ball. I believe it's called when they run into each other. So something like carbon tetrachloride down here is really big in terms of B, and it also because it has so many electrons, it also has a big A value. Water has a smaller A value and a smaller volume in general, um, and that's but it's still bigger than anything else that's the same size. Right, so more molecule, and we'll talk about why that is um, on Friday. We'll talk about intermolecular forces. So let's let's do a practice problem. Let's and let's add some more sig figs here because we want to know just how far off these are going to be. So let's say, let's call it. Where's the mouse? There it is. Let's go to five sig figs. We do point four one four. And let's go to 1.0000 and exact, say exactly. Zero Celsius, so we get to keep all of our sick things. So if it's not a Van der Waals gas, if we're just using PV equals NRT, I chose these numbers pretty carefully. What should the pressure be? One, right? 22.4 was 414 was our volume for one mole at STP. So if it was at, if it was an ideal gas, we would wind up with with an answer of one atmosphere. If we're using this other version, we need A, N over B squared, volume minus NB equals NRT. Everything's given, just have to find A for water which is that 5.46. And then units on that are really weird too. It's liters squared times ATM over uh, moles. And B is what, 0.0318? For water, did I misread that? Oh, sorry, three, three oh five. Thank you. What do we get? So we get NRT, N is one. Go to Wolfram Alpha. He does. You can all just type everything in and sit, hit solve for pressure if you want, if you're using a solver, if you're using Wolfram Alpha. Um, otherwise, we would just need to do NRT divided by this number, and then we can subtract off this number. What's that? Moles is one. Yeah, so we're going to get one times R times 273.15 
over parentheses 22.414 minus one times 0 0.305. Close parentheses. Then we're going to subtract off A, which was our 5.46. Uh, more parentheses. When in doubt, use more parentheses. Times n squared over b, right? So one squared over. I think I actually messed that up because that's not a reasonable number. I need more parentheses to match. Uh, oh, I forgot to square that. That's why. One point zero zero three. And I guess we're keeping all the sig figs two not yet three zero. So in other words, at standard temperature and pressure for a molecule like water, it's 0.3 percent off from the ideal gas law. Under normal conditions, we probably don't even have four sig figs by the end, right? So is it worth going to all this trouble? Under normal conditions, we're at standard at STP. Generally speaking, PV equals NRT is good enough. However, if we do have four sig figs, or either of our two corrections is significantly larger. So if n squared over v or n over v is really is really big, then that term gets big, right? And if if uh, n is really big in general, we're going to wind up with if n is really big relative to the amount of volume, then we wind up with the van der Waals equation being useful. But basically, as long as our two assumptions are reasonable, we don't need to use the van der Waals equation. Which is nice because solving for n or v is really tricky. Basically, use use the solver at that point. Bowling? No. So on on a timed test, I and actually probably even on the take home problem, I would say use Van der Waals equation and you know what is your percent error or something like that. But but I might ask you. I might ask you to explain why sometimes you need the Van der Waals equation and sometimes you don't. And the answer is generally, if you have a lot of mol if moles is really big relative to the volume that you have. If you have a very high pressure system, that also means you have really big concentration of moles per volume. Um, and it winds up being really important. But and I say that relative to STP, if you get above four atmospheres of pressure, you're probably in the range where you want to start considering whether or not to use that, the Van der Waals version or not. Um, one atmosphere, two atmospheres is probably okay. What else, what's another limitation besides solving for moles or volume is tricky. What's another limitation of this equation? Anybody think of anything? If it's not a common gas. If it's not a common gas. And you know, the the B term is not that hard to to visualize, but this one's really weird how well they interact with each other, right? Well, what if there's another type of gas? This is all for the gases interacting with, with itself, right? With another molecule of the same type. This says nothing about if you have a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, for instance. This just says, if you have hydrogen, you can use A and B, this A and B. If you have oxygen, you can use that A and B. If you have a mixture of both of them, that all goes out the window. 
So basically, this is only really useful if you have a pure gas. As soon as you have a mixture of gases, uh, it kind of falls apart. Because you would, I mean, just if we had a simple situation like, like our Hindenburg example, we had hydrogen and oxygen, right? Well, that means a hydrogen could run into a hydrogen or a hydrogen could run into an oxygen or an oxygen could run into an oxygen, right? Which means we would need three different A values. And basically we would have to expand this whole correction term that goes with pressure into being like moles of ox moles of hydrogen divided by volume squared moles of hydrogen times moles of oxygen divided by volume squared moles of oxygen squared divided by volume squared and have different a value for each of those terms that's yeah it's doable but it's beyond the scope of what what we need to do in most circumstances at that point i would just bail on Van der Waals equation entirely, unless I was writing a thesis or something on that, um, and just say, well, PV equals NRT is good enough for us for right now. All right. So if you start with this reaction, so carbon monoxide reacting with hydrogen to make methanol. Let's we'll start by balancing it. And then what is the limiting reactant when five grams of hydrogen reacts with 34.5 grams of carbon monoxide? And then the interesting one really at the end is if the reaction vessel starts at 1.51 atmospheres, what's the final pressure for the reaction above? At least balancing is easy, right? So ignoring everything gas laws related, if we want to find out the limiting reactant, what's the first thing we should do? Put everything in moles. So 5.001 grams of hydrogen is how many moles of hydrogen? It's going to be what, close to two and a half? 2.4. Nine something. Five point zero zero one divided by two point zero 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 eight. Sorry, two point zero one six. What do you get? Two point four nine. Give me one more sig fig. Four nine one. Perfect. And what do we get for carbon monoxide? Carbon monoxide, 12 plus 16. Oh, 34.0.502 grams and get 28.010 grams. Something between one and two, right? A little under 1.5. Significantly under 1.5. You're not going to make me get out of the calculator, are you? One point two three. One. Or two. Okay.
So what's going to run out first? We're using the hydrogen up twice as fast and we have a little bit more than twice as much hydrogen, right? If we double this, we're going to get 2.46. We have 2.49, so we should run out of of the carbon monoxide first, barely. So this is the example that, that I was telling you about where it can be really helpful to use an ice table, right? Even though we're assuming this reaction is gonna go to completion, we're at the end, we still need to know our final moles of all gases put together in order to get a final answer, right? So, and if you want to practice for figuring out which of these is the limiting reactant, remember it's one point, I think we say 1.232 moles CO and every one mole of CO used is two moles hydrogen used. So we get double this, well, that'll give us our moles of hydrogen used. If we want to know our final amounts of all of our chemicals in this reaction, we start with an ice table because it's going to track how everything changes together. Assuming we're starting with no methanol and no nothing else in the reaction chamber, we know we're going to use up X amount here minus 2x, then we're going to get plus x here, right? For every one time the reaction happens, you lose one CO, you lose two hydrogens, and you gain one methanol. And since we're pretty sure this is our limiting reactant, we know we're ending at zero for the carbon monoxide. So what's x? We have to use it all up. And we're, for every one mole of this we use, there's minus two and plus one over there. So X is 1.232 moles. So 2.491 minus two times 1.232. And our final concentration of Methanol is zero, that's what we started with, plus X or just X. So our moles of CO at the end are going to be zero. Moles of height, thanks. 0. 0.02 something. Two seven four. Two seven four is good enough because we're only going to the thousands place. And our final concentration of methanol, or number of moles, one point two three two moles. So assuming constant temperature and volume, what's our final pressure going to be? Well, we have a change. We're not given temperature and volume, so we can't just throw it into PV equals NRT, right? We also can't use um, 22 liters per mole because the pressure is changing. So we go to our combined simple gas law and we start crossing out everything that's not changing. All right, so our combined gas law was P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2. And remember, anything constant is gonna cancel out, right? 
So somebody else's question on the um, on the quiz was when do we when would we ever need to use the combined form? We don't. A lot of times you don't need to use the combined form with all the variables in it. But if you have this, you have all of the simpler ones. So this is a good one. In fact, this is the way it shows up on your conversion sheet, right? On your equation sheet. All you have to do is start crossing stuff off that's not changing. So volume's not changing. So it's the same on both sides. It goes away. Temperature is not changing. So we're using P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2. I don't even remember what, maybe that's Avogadro's law. No, it's a version of Avogadro's law, but Avogadro's law had volume versus moles. So I don't even know what that law is called. It doesn't matter. We know it's true. And as long as we know what pressure and moles are, we can use it. So plug in 1.51 for P1 over, what was our starting moles? It was both of those put together, right? I just erased that number. But it was 1.232 and 2.491. Is that what it was? Equals P2, which is what we're solving for. What's our new total number of moles? Zero plus 0 0.027 plus 1.232. Or 1 1.259. So what do we get for a final number? Something roughly the third of what we started with, right? How did I know it was going to be about a third of what we started with? I wasn't just doing all this math in my head. We started with three gas molecules and we made one gas molecule, right? And we had very little left over on this side. So we almost perfectly said for every three molecules, we turned it into one molecule. So we should wind up with something about a third of what we started with in terms of pressure, because we have a third as many moles, roughly. All right. So we can get a little bit creative with stoichiometry problems now that we have gas loss too. We can do interesting stuff like this where you don't have to use an ice table, but trying to keep track of everything that's changing all at the same time can, it's really easy to miss something if you don't have a way to organize your thoughts about it. If you just made sure you went left to right and you were very careful about moles of this minus moles used all, all the way across the board, that's all an ice table really is. You don't have to write it as an ice table. It's just helpful sometimes. At least I find it helpful that way. Any questions on this one? Other than why does Google hate my text characters so much? All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, vapor pressure. So the last few topics are kind of related to pressure or to gases, but they're a little bit different than just looking at, at gas laws. Um, so they're a little conceptual 
in some places. They're kind of vocab dependent. So vapor pressure is basically, like I mentioned before, one way to think about vapor pressure is how much of a liquid is going to be in the gas phase at equilibrium for a particular system. So in in most cases, in the, the everyday example that's related to that is it's basically saying how much water could be dissolved in the atmosphere as a gas at 100% humidity. So we don't usually see 100% humidity in meteorology, right? Um, but if you take a sealed container half filled with water and you seal it, a lot of times if you sealed it when it was warm and then it gets cold, what do you see on the inside of the water bottle in the morning? You see condensation on the inside, right? Or frost, depending on, on how cold it got. Well, how did that condensation get there? Because you had a fixed amount of water and then you sealed it. So it's not like it's the atmospheric water condensing. It's the water from your water bottle that was evaporating into the gas phase. And then when the temperature drops, the amount of water that you can have condensed or that you can have dissolved drops. So again, going back to relative humidity, relative humidity is a pretty good way of, of estimating how it feels on your skin. Um, when you're basically, if you're at a hundred percent humidity, your sweat can't evaporate, right? And so if your sweat can't evaporate, your body doesn't really have another way of cooling you down. That is your body's only way of keeping you at a reasonable body temperature is by sweating. And then as that evaporates, it carries heat away from your skin that way. With If you're at hundred percent humidity, that's basically saying there's the water in the atmosphere is already saturated with water. If the water's, if the atmosphere is already saturated with water, your sweat can't evaporate. If your sweat can't evaporate, it feels hotter than it normally would which is why 80%, 80 degrees Fahrenheit at 80% humidity feels a lot hot, hotter than 90 degrees at 0% humidity. I guess that's partly a matter of taste, but you're not gonna be sticky the same way um, in 90 degrees with zero humidity as you are with 80 and 80. Um, the, Right, so that's the other aspect to it. So where, where relative humidity breaks down is if we wanna talk about how many moles of water or an actual amount of water, because that changes the, based on temperature. Um, if we think of evaporation as being an equilibrium reaction, uh, liquid going to H2O as a gas, what would the equilibrium expression be for this reaction? The, what's, what are the first two rules of equilibrium? Products of reactants. And what's the third rule? That's the second one. Liquids don't count, right? Anything with a constant concentration doesn't count. So the equilibrium expression here is really just how much water there is, concentration of water as a gas, which is just another way of saying vapor pressure. Um, and it's going to be dependent on temperature. So I've, I know I've said we weren't gonna do anything with the math here, but um, our expression for an equilibrium constant was the energy involved, it's constant times the energy involved, energy change over RT, T has that, kind of a really complicated exponential relationship there. When temperature changes, your equilibrium constant changes, which means the amount of water that you can find in the gas phase changes, which is why for our example of our water bottle sealed in your car overnight, you wind up with condensation on the inside of the water bottle because when the temperature drops, this number drops. And if this number drops, all that water that's a, that is currently evaporated, it has to find a place to go. So it condenses as condensation or it forms frost, depending on how cold it got and how quickly. 
All right, and it really just comes down to, here's another example of the statistics here, is out of all of these liquid molecules you have floating around, they all have some attractive force between them, which is why they're present as liquid, um, why they're sticking together. But they don't all have the same amount of energy. Each of those gas molecules is gonna have its own amount of energy. And we can predict roughly what that's going to be. We can predict with the, um, in general, what the kinetic energy is, or on average, what the kinetic energy of each gas molecule is. But basically, there's a there's a significant chance every time a gas small or a liquid molecule hits the surface of the liquid that it has enough energy to break free from the rest of the gas molecule or rest of the liquid molecules. And when it does that, it becomes a, a gas molecule. And so what that that effectively means is is if you change how much kinetic energy each of those gas those liquid molecules has you change the probability that it can escape from the rest of the liquid. It's not truly a bell curve, but it looks a lot like a bell curve. Have we talked about Boltzmann in here? Boltzmann distribution. Um, if we plot what this looks like, like we're doing statistics, okay, we're just gonna plot what's the average or how much kinetic energy all the gas molecules have. We wind up with the distribution that looks kind of like a bell curve, except it's skewed towards the right. What's that? Well, I guess I'm I'm rusty on my stat on my statistics lingo. Is that skewed right or skewed left? Skewed left. Um, but the other thing that's weird about this, we can't just treat it like a Gaussian distribution, because what happens at zero? It stops. Can you have less kinetic energy than zero? No, because it would extend infinitely in both directions, right? This is called a Boltzmann distribution instead of a Gaussian distribution because it has this point where everything stops. And basically, if you pick the molecule at random, statistically, it's going to fall, it's going to behave like a bell curve here, where you can say, okay, well, there's a, you know, a, 68% probability it's within one standard deviation of the of the average. But the math looks a little bit different because it's not a true Gaussian distribution. You don't find standard deviation the same way even. And really, the way this really becomes useful is if you have some theoretical value that corresponds to something happens when molecules get above that amount of energy, like say they have enough energy to break free of being liquid. If you can just find the total area under the curve above that energy cutoff, that's gonna allow you to predict what fraction of the molecules have that much energy, which all of this to say is it's really just a, very, a specialized branch of statistics that focuses on how does the universe behave rather than just how does randomness behave, which is all statistics really is, right? Statistics is how random is random. Therm statistical thermodynamics is how random is the universe. All right, so what are we gonna do with this? Well, we're not really gonna do much with actually finding any integrals in this class. Calculus is not a prerequisite. This isn't a fun function to integrate, really. Um, turns out, remember that that constant times e to the minus delta h over rt. Delta h is your cutoff. One over e to the one over rt. If you plot that out properly, you get this function. And when you integrate e, you wind up with a constant times e, right? Who's had calc? I guess that's calc two. You guys do integrals yet? Tomorrow. Well, you know what the derivative is of e, right? Derivative of e is e, right? So it gets to be a nasty equation to try and integrate that, but it's dual.
So don't drop the ladder. You were here, so you can get at least one speed. Or if you aren't able to complete it on your own, and she got all the way to the back filtration part, I feel like we could be like, can we do it on the Um, Actually, this is for the, um. sorry, I was thinking just the back filtration. This is one of the series. Yeah, it just kept like, yeah, try it, try it again. You got time, right? We're not adding a whole lot of assignments this, this week, so use tomorrow. You can get it. If you still can't, I would use two days on it. Try it tomorrow and then you can turn it in and get it. Thanks for being on the air. We can do like a pressure lab. Yeah. Because I just I looked at our data. Either the scale wasn't working or if the plunger wasn't probably working. We you check your plunger, I looked at this. Yeah, you had Okay, so that could have been it. Yeah, we've got time tomorrow. Get some good numbers. <laughs>